let's uh, set up the presentation first. Uh, Dr. Smith, you should be able to share your presentation and screen now. Fantastic. And Devenda, if I could ask you to check that Dr. Smith is in the spotlight and visible to everybody. Perfect. Right, so it is now my great pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker for this session. Dr. Rona Smith is a senior research associate at the University of Cambridge and an honorary consultant in renal medicine and vasculitis at Cambridge University Hospitals NHS Foundation Trust in the United Kingdom. Rona's research focuses on optimizing trial designs Key areas of interest are approaches to make trials more efficient, such as using routinely collected healthcare data and platform designs, and strategies to make clinical trial research less burdensome for patients, such as facilitating co-enrollment into studies, sharing data across trials, and varied approaches to consent. Rona is the medical director of the patient-led Research Hub in Cambridge, which adopts a unique model of putting patients at the heart of research and co-producing from the outset. I'm delighted to introduce Rona's talk entitled Co-Producing Research with Patient Partners. Rona, a warm welcome to our symposium and over to you. Great, well, thank you very much for the invitation to speak today. Um, and for that very kind introduction. So I'm going to talk to you uh, today really about my uh, experience of leading the patient-led research hub for the last couple of years and actually what that involves um, in terms of uh, collaboration with patient partners. So by way of an introduction, just trying to move my slides. I'm going to talk about three things today. Firstly, um, about uh, patient and public involvement in research, and then a bit about the patient-led research hub. And then I'm gonna finish with some case studies of co-production projects that we have done um, within the patient-led research hub. So going over a little bit what was said in the introductory sec section um, a few minutes ago, what do we actually mean by patient public involvement? And I'm going to use the term PPI throughout. So traditionally, we used to have a group of researchers, whether that be basic scientists, clinicians, other allied health professionals. But they tended to work very separately from patients or those individuals that were being researched. And so what PPI really is doing is putting members of public in the research team. And what is absolutely key to um, successful patient and public involvement is full integration into the research team. So, so why do we do it? Well, from a researcher's perspective, I think it improves the quality and the relevance of research. Um, having patient involvement right from the outset means that you're formulating questions that matter to patients. You're asking um, important research questions. Um, those of us who do clinical trials um, will recognize many of the challenges doing trials. Recruitment is often a challenge. Retention of patients for long-term follow-up is a challenge. So involving patients in the design of studies uh, so that you can get their input in terms of frequency of visits and mode of collection of data is vitally important to ensure that engagement is, is throughout um, the duration of the study. And ultimately, this is actually um, increases efficiency. It reduces research waste. It means that studies are more likely to recruit to time and target. So this slide is now several years old, but actually I think um, it really illustrates the importance of a patient and public involvement. And this is based on a survey of um, a large number of individuals, over one and a half thousand individuals, 
who were asked to um, say what their background was, whether they worked for a commercial organisation, whether predominantly they were academic or whether predominantly a patient. Um, and you can see the difference in priorities depending on the people that you ask the question to. So probably understandably for commercial organisations, drugs, vaccines, biological agents were definitely the priorities for research area. Academics, it was much more balanced between new agents, repurposing agents, and then what we'd often call uh, uh, quality of life symptoms. But you can see for patients, the balance is very different. So clearly uh, for, for many patients, um, lifestyle and symptom management is of far greater importance than, than new uh, drugs or repurposing of drugs. So there's clearly a mismatch of what researchers think is important and what patients think is important. So what does PPI look like um, in a trial? So I think it's key to involve a variety of relevant voices. And actually, this is a real challenge because reaching out and getting PPI from the whole range of people that um, are affected by a condition can be hugely challenging. It needs to start right at the beginning of the project um, and involve every stage of the project. Um, as I said, it needs to actively pursue inclusivity and diversity. You have to think about the methods um, and how appropriate are they to the audience um, and the actual research project that you're doing. So really tailoring to the community that you're trying to reach out to. Communication is key um, and the language used is also vital. And it's really important that uh, patients' contributions are acknowledged both in terms of recognition, but also remuneration for their time um, that they put in into any work that they do. And it's important that we reflect on the whole process and what's worked and what hasn't worked and what we need to do as a, as a group to make things better next time round. I think one of the key things to take away from all of this is that it takes time. It really does take time to build a relationship, to build trust, um, and to build that environment where people feel comfortable enough to really freely express uh, what, what their views are. So just thinking about PPI throughout a trial process. So it can be right at the beginning, the design. So involving patients means that you can refine the research question. Think about what matters, what outcomes are you going to measure? Sometimes measuring the easiest outcome may not be the most clinically relevant outcome to patients. Um, think about the protocol. Um, is it feasible and acceptable what you're going to be asking participants to do? The frequency that they need to come for visits, um, the number of blood tests that they're going to have. Um, make sure that it's acceptable to participants. Patients can be hugely um, helpful with recruitment strategies um, in terms of their networks um, and thinking about ways of actually reaching out to all people um, in their particular disease community. And they can certainly review patient facing documentation, making sure that it really gets the right message across in an accessible way. And then in terms of the actual delivery of the research, rather than just being participants providing their data, they can actually be sitting on committees, for example, trial steering committees, trial management group committees. Um, some uh, studies have employed roles of recruitment ambassadors where they actually um, really facilitate um, getting out to communities where you're wanting to re uh, reach with the research. And they can also um, be involved um, with uh, interpretation of data and, and, and results. And then once all this research has been done, it's really important to get the message out, um, get it out in a way that is understandable with language that is accessible 
and that the message of the research is really clear. Um, so they can reach out to the, 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 the communities that, that where this needs to be um, heard. As I said early on, it's really important to acknowledge involvement. So co-authorship on, on manuscripts is important. And, and <clears throat> involvement in actually um, dissemination and action plans from the research. So as Tina said, there are different types of PPI, really kind of a gradation of PPI. So from consultation to collaboration to co-production. So consultation is really just asking patients views, one-off meetings, maybe a, a patient panel. Collaboration is a much more integrated role. So you get an ongoing partnership, maybe patients would sit on the trial steering committee um, or the trial management committee, and they're involved in all stages of the result, uh, research, designing, undertaking it, disseminating results. But co-production takes that one step further. So it's really about researchers, practitioners, public, patients working together and it's the sharing of power and responsibility right from the beginning to the end of the project, generating the data, generating the knowledge, and it is a, a, it's a partnership throughout from beginning to end. So there are different types of PPI and what, what we often call more traditional PPI is when, for example, industry or academia have formulated a research question. They've identified an area of clinical need, of academic interest, a commercial opportunity maybe with a new agent. They have formulated a research proposal, drawn up a protocol, drawn up a patient information sheet. And it's often at this point that public patient involvement is requested prior to a funding application. And, and many funding applications now mandate that there is a patient public involvement um, before you can submit. But I'm going to move on now to talk about the patient ed research hub, which is really just trying to flip this into a different way of thinking. And so the patient ed research hub has been um, in existence since um, May 2015. And it was set up by my predecessor, predecessor my predecessor, Thomas Heimstra, and I took over leading it um, a couple of years ago. And I have to acknowledge Laura Cowley, who, is, who works with me tirelessly and is the, the key person that makes all these projects actually happen. But what we're doing is before we even have a research idea, the patients come first. So patients come to us with a question, um, a problem, an issue, and um, we work with them and a supporting patient organization or a charity to really see is this question or issue that they come to us with something that we can formulate into a research question. So the first thing that we do um, is when an individual patient comes to us, we ask that they partner up with, with an organization or a support group or a charity. Um, and we do a feasibility assessment to see whether the actual idea that they've got is feasible to take forwards. And if it is feasible, we often work together doing pilot work um, to generate some pilot data to put together a funding application. Sometimes um, it, a question comes to us and, and we're not really sure whether it is feasible or not. So we may need to un uh, undertake some background work, literature reviews to see, firstly, um, what's known already um, and actually can we, we formulate this into a question. On occasions, um, people have come to us with, with questions that we know other groups are researching. And so we've uh, built uh, uh, links with patients and, and researchers. And sometimes it's clear that um, a proposal isn't feasible. And when things are not feasible, um, we always offer patients the opportunity to submit a proposal, a new proposal. The kind of things that are often not feasible are when um, patient groups come to us really wanting us to produce um, a kind of publicity material or educational material. Um, and what we're keeping our focus on is really um, developing research questions. 
So just putting these two types of PPI side by side, what you can see is really patients have moved right to the forefront um, of, of, of the research. So in terms of actually establishing um, the PLRH, um, sorry, my slides are going very bizarre. <laughs> oh, um, so establishing the PLRH, um, the whole concept was that we wanted to support and co-produce research um, with, with patient organisations and charities. We have no research agenda. Um, so this in many ways is one of the biggest challenge. We have absolutely no idea what the next question will be, which group that will come from, um, but we will accept any original research idea on any healthcare topic. Um, it's key that um, the patient organisation stays uh, uh, active all the way through the project. Um, we develop a team with patients, researchers, clinicians, um, and work together throughout. Um, in terms of funding applications, many of the funding streams that we go for are much smaller funding streams with focus on, on benefits for patient priorities. Um, and we spend a lot of time building um, a partnership, building trust, building mutual respect. Um, and these projects do take time. Um, we are supported by funding from the uh, Cambridge Biomedical Research Centre and we sit nested within the Cambridge Clinical Trials Unit. So we have the support of, of statisticians, data managers from there, and also um, supported by uh, the University of Cambridge School of Clinical Medicine. And we are governance, uh, our governance follows the same structure as the Cambridge University Hospitals PPI um, department. So in the past seven years, what have we done? So we have had 55 research ideas proposed to us from 24 patient organisations and 24 individuals across 44 healthcare conditions. And of that, it's led to 23 feasible projects. So three of those we referred on to other specialists um, who were doing research in that area. Uh, two projects we, we linked up to other ongoing studies and five of the approaches um, the, the patients have actually asked to defer um, at present. So that's led to 13 co-produced proposals. Um, so we have three projects in development, um, six active projects and, and three completed projects. So just thinking about the projects that weren't feasible, um, first of all, before I talk through um, the successes. Um, so nine of the proposals came from individuals without um, a, a support group. Um, and one of the things that we, we've done is really we've tried to partner up with the relevant patient organization or patient charities. Um, so that we're not really taking forward just projects of a, an individual. So we want to make sure that the relevant patient community um, is on board with, with the research. Um, seven people um, after an initial approach didn't follow up with, with future uh, uh, communications. Six of our proposals actually weren't research really, they were much more um, educational or awareness campaigns. Um, we had uh, five approaches from organisations that already had really quite well developed experienced research teams within the charities, so some of the much larger charities. Um, three um, of the patient partners couldn't commit to the work that was required to really do a project and two approaches were really just requests for funding. So if you look at the feasible proposals that we, we had, so about a third were asking us to investigate a new or repurposed treatment. 22% um, were wanting to know more about the actual disease pathogenesis. Um, but the vast majority, 43%, were improving symptom management quality of life. Um, so, so key things, for example, were fatigue. Um, 
in terms of the research topic, it really spans a whole host of, of conditions. Uh, the largest proportion here, renal, I think reflects that this was set up by my colleague Thomas Heimstra, who's a nephrologist. Um, and, and that I think is where the bulk of the research originally came from. But I have to say now, um, despite myself being a nephrologist, we are being much broader in terms of the, the disease areas that we're covering. And it just depends on what comes to us um, from, from the patient groups. So what have been the real challenges? So challenges include um, managing expectations, making sure that what the patient uh, groups that we're working with um, and, and what they're wanting is actually what we're expecting to, to deliver. Um, one of the key things that the PLRH does is really act as a go-between and um, we need to link up the patient experts with clinical experts in their fields. Um, and so we really do need to engage researchers and clinicians to, to partake in this work. And although uh, PPI is definitely much, much uh, more, more considered in the UK, um, there are still um, some uh, researchers, clinicians that, that feel it's, it's less important. Um, Funding is challenging. So, so many of the, the questions that the patient groups come to us with need some kind of feasibility work to be done. And so sourcing this uh, seed funding before you can go on to do bigger uh, proposals it is always a challenge. And I think the other big challenge is, is many patient partners want to be involved, but find the the commitment that goes to be a co-applicant on an application, um, quite a burdensome thought. Um, and as researchers, um, when we're doing applications, the, the amount of time and effort that we need to uh, put in is huge. And patient partners are juggling often their own job with a family life, with an illness, with doing research. And I think we just need to be mindful about how we balance that. We've needed to really build a network with the patient led research hub, so a network of um, at all levels with, with patient partners, with patient charities, uh, with clinicians, um, with other trial methodologists to really get to this point. And the biggest limitation that we have at the moment is just our core capacity. It's just myself and Nora at the moment who run this. We're looking to expand. Um, and that's in part why we um, have been very much focused on taking forward projects that definitely have a research question. So how do we um, make sure that we're inclusive? Um, so it's really being mindful and thinking that um, you need to be inclusive. And actually, a one size fits all approach to this does not work. Uh, you have to think individually about the patient group that is approaching you and that you're working with. Um, actually, COVID has been really good for this. We've had to find new ways of working and the remote um, working has really facilitated uh, patient ed research um, work. So we now use far more Zoom and Teams calls um, and meetings rather than a meeting in person historically. Um, one thing that's really key is even when engaging with patient partners and working in a manner to co-produce work, we need to be mindful that there will be unheard voices still. And so how do we really reach out to everybody to be truly inclusive? Um, so in terms of um, it, reaching out, it's patient partners reaching out further, building that network and using community groups. Um, and again, it's, as I said, um, thinking about what's convenient and comfortable for, for, for patients um, and, and when to hold the meetings, how long should the meetings be, in what format, um, and, and recognizing that this isn't the same for all patient groups and we really do need to have a flexible approach. 
So in terms of success, key thing is resource and time. So staff and Laura has been the absolute key to the patient led research hub. She really is this interim person between clinicians and the patient groups um, that has just brought everything together. We need finances support to do this. Uh, to reimburse patients, we need to make sure that if people are contributing to research, that their time and travel is, is um, accounted for. And we need to make it um, accessible to everybody who wants to take part. Um, the other thing to think about is skills and training. So patient partners come to us as experts in their, their condition. They may never have done any research at all, um, but they are bringing to the table their expertise. And so what we need to do is work out what skills and training our patient partners need in the same way what skills and training researchers need when working on a particular condition. So in terms of attributes, I think one of the key thing is commitment. It takes time to do this. Leadership is, is um, a challenging one because there needs to be leadership, but there also needs to be um, equity and uh, respect and, and a balance so that everybody's voice is heard. And there needs to be stable um, and consistent uh, approach to things. So really the patient ed research work hub is a new way of working. So this is how I like to kind of think traditional research. So we often think of, um, starting with an idea or a question, designing a study, conducting a study and then disseminating the results. Historically, patients played the biggest part in the conduct. So actually that's when they were taking part. Lesser extent in terms of actually designing the study and disseminating the results and really very little impact in terms of actually coming up with the idea or the research question. So what we're doing is really trying to flip this completely on its head. And so actually what we have is a partnership right from the very beginning. So patients come with ideas and together with research support, collaborate together to design the project and then in partnership actually carry out the project and then all the way through to disseminating the results. And so I kind of like to think of this as the new way of patient involvement. And one of the things that the Patient Ed Research Hub is going to do is really shift towards a rare disease focus. So in terms of rare diseases, what we mean is a rare disease is something affecting less than one in 2000 people. However, rare diseases, if you put them all together, are very common. And within the UK, three and a half million people live with a rare disease. There is a massive unmet need for rare diseases. Um, less than 5% have an approved treatment. Um, and this is across a whole host of rare diseases. Many are serious, life-threatening, and three in 10 children with a rare disease die before their fifth birthday. And there's a real drive within the UK from the National, Health, um, Nas National Institute of Health Research to make rare disease research a priority. So why did we decide as the patient-led research hub to really uh, focus here? Well, we've had to um, streamline our resources because of, of capacity. But when we look back at all our proposals, over 70% of them came from rare disease patient groups and rare disease communities. And what we hear time and time again is that often people with rare diseases or ultra rare diseases really feel, feel lost. Um, Patient charities they have are often set up by a, an individual with the condition and they really, um, the avenues to, to get support for research funding it is a real challenge. So what we're really doing is building this partnership hub, partnership hub across rare disease with the patient groups and the broader rare disease community, so health professionals, clinicians, scientists working in that area. And together with um, other groups supporting patient public involvement, there are a number of what we call rare disease umbrella charities within the UK. So Beacon for Rare Diseases is a great example. 
and collaborating together with industry as well. We're trying to build this partnership hub, partnership hub where patients with rare diseases can come together. We're wanting patients to sh shape how this looks. Are there common themes that go across rare diseases that actually we could, we could study um, across multiple rare diseases, thinking of things such as, as fatigue, depression, they're common in many, many of these rare diseases, but it's very difficult to get a study with an ultra rare disease, but could common themes uh, come out across these groups? So just gonna end with some case studies. So uh, one case study is, is from a, a charity that's called Ring20 Research and Support UK. So Ring20 is a very rare chromosomal disorder which leads to a refractory epilepsy. And the patient group came to us wanting to explore the role of a ketogenic diet in this condition. And so we worked with the patient group doing a literature research uh, project on, on ketogenic diets in refractory epilepsy. We then worked with the patient's uh, uh, group and also with clinicians involved to think about the acceptability of a ketogenic diet. And now this has led on to further work within the um, Epicare uh, um, um, uh, field of taking this project forward of a ketogenic diet in Ring20. Uh, the next project um, that, that's completed is something called DRINK um, in, a, in a rare kidney disease, autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease. And that's a, a disease where patients accumulate cysts in their kidneys over years and eventually leads to kidney failure. And there's been debate about whether a high water intake, um, which um, would make your urine more dilute um, and suppress vasopressin activity can actually slow the growth of kidney cysts. And so this feasibility study was designed with patient partners from the Polycystic Kidney Disease Charity to look to see whether it would be feasible to run a study of a high water intake as opposed to a standard water intake in 42 patients, and to see whether that actually led to a reduction in urine osmolality, um, and then actually whether it was acceptable to patients and how they wanted to record and monitor their water intake. And that has now been published. And then third case study is, is um, a, a, a study that is basically led out to uh, a spin out company called Calium Health. So um, patient group with Gittleman syndrome, which is another renal condition, which is characterized by losing lots of potassium in the urine. And so often patients have to take lots of potassium tablets, which are really quite unpleasant and very regular blood tests. And this um, developed a device which effectively used finger prick blood monitoring of potassium to be able to guide uh, patients in terms of adjusting their dose of potassium supplementation. Um, and then th the lead on this project has taken it forward and it's now become a commercial entity um, undergoing development. And then the final story um, uh, that I'm gonna just share is a project that's actually ongoing at the moment. And this is with the Childhood Tumor Trust. And we were approached by, uh, by them about a condition called neurofibromatosis type one, which is um, a condition where often children and teenagers develop multiple tumors, um, can develop other developmental delay. Um, and one of the things that they wanted to really understand was the referral pathway to regional centers of excellence. And they wanted to look at it both from the perspective of patients and parents uh, with neurofibromatosis type one, but also with clinicians um, who look after um, individuals with neurofibromatosis type one. And this has started off as, as a survey um, and there's been over a thousand responses to that survey from patients and, and I think 81 from healthcare professionals. 
And this um, uh, was submitted as an abstract to the British Pediatric Neurology Association. And that abstract has been accepted for presentation. And actually it's the patient partner who's going to go and stand at that conference, the medical conference and present this work um, early next year. So I hope that's kind of illustrated just a range of the, the things that, that we work on um, and just give a flavor of, of what we're doing. And I, I want to end with this quote um, because I really like this, this, this quote. Um, so no matter how complicated the research or how brilliant the researcher, patients and the public always offer unique and valuable insights. Their advice when designing, implementing and evaluating research invariably makes studies more effective, more credible and often more cost efficient as well. And I think that just really sums up um, what uh, patient public involvement means for me. And I'd like to just finish um, on that note. Um, and if you want to see more information about Patient Led Research Hub, um, there, there, is, there are our contact details. I'm going to stop sharing there. Thank you very much. Great, fantastic. Thank you very, very much, Rona, for this um, lovely insight into the Patient-Led Research Hub and your work and your experience uh, with patient and public involvement. Um, I would now like to uh, invite uh, Veronica and Isabel to turn on your cameras as well. And we have a good amount of time um, to have some Q&A. There have been some um, questions coming in from the audience. We can see that we have uh, about 40 attendees today to this session uh, in the audience. Um, but before I turn to the questions in the audience, Rona, may I ask you, um, this is such a unique setup, the Patient-Led Research Hub. Are you, are you aware of another similar setup or, or organization in the UK or internationally? So there are certainly um, within the UK, there are other groups that do focus on co-producing research with patients. So for example, um, Imperial College in London has, a, has a, 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 an organization co-producing research. I think what's different here is that we have no research agenda at all. We take what comes to us. Um, which I think is one of the, the real challenges, but I also think it's what what makes it unique. Um, so so patients come from from all directions and it, it's it's the patients that, that shape the whole project right from the outset. And to follow on as much as you are able to say, um, I'm sure some of us were wondering about the, fin the financing structure for the patient-led research hub, um, it, as it is such a unique and perhaps also perhaps a bit of a, a risky uh, undertaking to set up some, something like that. Um, are you limited in your funding? Is there going to be an evaluation period or are you funded for the foreseeable future? So, so we're supported um, by the National Institute of Health Research through the, um, the, the Cambridge BRC, and they're on a five year funding cycle. So they have committed to supporting um, the, the patient led research hub as it is at the moment. In terms of um, uh, Laura and myself um, would love to grow the research hub, but we need more res resource. And so we have put in further um, funding applications really for core funding to be able to expand the team. We deliberately haven't uh, really publicized ourselves too widely because I think both of us are nervous that if we get an influx of requests um, and projects, we want to be able to support um, and, and we don't want to disappoint. So, so I think we are just coming out of a period of two and a half years of COVID where we've really been treading water, but we're looking to grow with, with further core funding applications that we should hear about early next year. Well, I'm certainly keeping my fingers crossed for you. Okay, 
Great. Um, so um, I'm looking at the uh, questions that have come in uh, through the Q&A chat. Um, the first question from Lena Rettinger. Um, I would be interested in your experience of the process of getting an ethical vote for the patient public involvement on a recurring basis, such as at the patient-led research hub. Is there an ethical vote for each involvement step or project, or did you manage to get one ethical vote for building this group and incorporating them on different matters or research steps and projects? So a question about um, ethical approval or ethical votes for patient and public involvement activities. Um, and perhaps I would ask you, Rona, to give us the UK view on this, which I'm also familiar with, and then perhaps I can comment um, on the Austrian current developments in, in this context. Yeah, so this is an excellent question. Um, so um, we don't have overarching ethical approval for the patient led research hub. We have, we have to apply for approval on a project by project basis. Not necessarily all the projects that we do require ethical approval. So, for example, if uh, patients are con uh, contributing um, anonymous survey data um, and it's not, uh, then we can on occasions, if we're developing it as a feasibility step, not have ethical approval. But generally, what we do for an individual project is develop an ethics application and submit it that way. The timelines tend to be quite quick. Um, often these are not um, what you'd call controversial or high risk studies. Um, so very different from doing clinical trials. Um, but it is an individual basis basis step-by-step -step, uh, project and, and often the challenge comes is, is about um, data and ownership of the data. Thank you and uh, I can just add from the Austrian perspective uh, which I'll also put in the chat right now um, the Open Innovation in Science Centre which is a center within um, our funding organization, the Ludwig Boltzmann Society in Austria, um, offers consultations and resources about patient and public involvement. And in that context, also about ethical aspects of patient and public involvement. Uh, and colleagues there are very helpful and very happy to be approached uh, and to advise on an individual basis. Uh, so I can uh, very warmly recommend um, that team in case there are any specific queries, project related queries. Um, then we have another question in the chat from an anonymous um, audience member. Any challenges with reaching patients, perhaps underserved, that may have a hard time engaging or participating? And perhaps uh, here I would um, open the question to. Isabel and Veronica, perhaps uh, any thoughts on your part about reaching underserved patients or those hard to engage patients? Um, yeah, from my perspective, I'm not experienced as a Rona, of course, and just starting the recruitment process. But for me, it's very hard to really get into the research field and find persons who want to be um, ambassadors or who want to be key stakeholders, which go out in, into the field and yeah, promoting what we do and, and just yeah, do things like Veronica does at our institute, talking to people, opening up science for them and keep it on, on really on, on eye level. Um, it's really hard to find these key stakeholders for me at the moment. And I experienced that it's more easy to address them directly than just spreading emails or putting information into newsletters. So contacting them personally is the most effective way for me at the moment. Thank you, Froni. Any tips from your side? Well, uh, I think the, the recruiting from patients is a, um, 
we, we speak a lot of with our patients. Would you like to join? Uh, what are your experience in something else? Um, we we have contact with our stakeholder, the Herzverband Austria, as something else. Um, but the recruiting and something else um, um, for our diseases, because I think it's a, a different between diseases when you have got a, um, a lower quality of life. Yeah. So uh, our patients do not have so much. Um, well, they had a heart attack and then they get something uh, inside the heart and they have no. Um, um, well, Tina, help me, Leidensdruck. I cannot. Uh, uh, no, no burden of disease. Yeah. yeah, no burden of disease and something else. So, so they they do not recognize it sometimes that they are ill or have an illness. So it's it's uh, much more difficult to recruit uh, people. Yeah, I think so. And it's one part of that. And 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 um. But when we are talking, when I talk with them about uh, uh, the solutions we want to make, uh, uh, they come and and work with us together. That's I think that's the key. It's also important. And I can just echo that. So uh, the the direct approach and the investment in and building a conversation, building that relationship. Um, and Veronica, you have been very helpful in your role uh, for us in, in our institute uh, in, in that respect. Rona, I, would you add yeah, anything was, from your yeah, side? I was just, just going to say, I think often reaching out through patients, through their networks, um, it is, is once you've found one or two, two patients, then often they have contacts and can bring people in. I think one of the barriers that I find are people are often nervous that they're not qualified enough to do it. They, they don't, they're, they're worried that they don't know about research and so that they won't be qualified to do it. And what we always try and say is, is that they are experts, they are equals and they're an expert in their own right and they are far more expert on their condition than, than kind of other clinicians are. And so they're coming to the table as, as an expert and they're bringing what they know um, and it's really making them I think not be frightened that it, it's something they're taking on and going to be out of their depth. Which was your take home message as well, Veronica, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah. 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 Thank you for that. Um, next question from Christopher Bull. Uh, what are the key considerations for someone to think about to avoid tokenistic involvement of PPI at all stages of a co-produced project? i.e. how are they involved, but when? Um, do you have a specific technique? Okay, so uh, 